Algebra 1, Spiral Exam Number 4, Study Guide. So Spiral Exam Number 4 is the final for Algebra 1. And it's a test that covers everything that you have studied in Algebra 1. It's a cumulative exam. So to get ready for this spiral, you need to go over all the concepts that you've learned and look over the problems. This study guide will cover key concepts and skills that are on the test. You should also review your other spiral study guides from Spiral 1, 2, and 3. Your concept notes and then unit study guides to help you. The test is multiple choice like the ones before. These review questions will mainly cover concepts in units 5 and 8, which are the newer units that you've had, and then a few earlier concepts. Number 1 is one of those earlier concepts. It comes from Unit 4B, Concept 26. So you need to be able to determine a line of fit from a set of data. An ice cream store keeps track of their sales in dollars each day compared to the noon temperature. Write an equation that would best represent the line of fit. You can use Desmos.com to help. But let me show you how you can just do it on your own. So remember a line of fit is going to be a line that is right through the middle of the data. You try to get as many points above as below. Now we only need two points to write an equation of a line. So when I did this a little earlier, and at least looks about the same, I did not choose to use two of my data points. Instead, I looked at my line and picked out two clear points. So I've got a clear point at 17 degrees, and this is Celsius, and then $350. So 17, 350. And then I have another clear point at 21, 450. Well, that's where it was when I was working this before, so I'm going to use that. So 21, 450. Now the two things that we need to know to write an equation of a line are the slope and the y-intercept. So to find the slope, we're going to take the difference in y's divided by the difference in x's. So that will give us 100 over, make that 17 a little clearer, 4, or $25 per degree Celsius. Now, for the y-intercept, if your graph goes to 0, you can look at your graph. But this one does not, and so my line would keep going. So we're not really sure when the temperature or the x value is zero where it would cross. But we can just use the method that you've been using where we take one of the points. So I'm just going to take the first point, 17 and 350, use those x and y values to plug in slope intercept to find my y intercept. So we'll have 350 equals 25 times the slope which is 7 or sorry the x value which is 17 25 times 17 is 425 so 350 minus 475 will be our y intercept and that is a negative 75 so now we know our slope and our y-intercept, so we can write the equation of the line. So y, or the money that the ice cream shop brings in, is 25x minus 75. Now let's look at number 2. Number 2 is also, well, no, it is actually a concept from Unit 5. So you need to be able to figure the measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. Joey wants to have a bowling average of 215. That's a mean. The first seven games, he scored those scores that you see. What must he score in the eighth game to have an average of 215? So we know the average. To find the average or the mean, you're going to add up all the values that you have and then divide by those number of values. But what we're missing here is we're missing one of them. 
So we're going to put an x placeholder for that value. So I'm going to pause and set up the problem and you do that as well. So now our problem is set up. So we have all of those seven bowling scores plus an x placeholder for the score in his eighth grade game divided by eight equaling the average that he wants. Now to get rid of this eight we just undo it. So we're going to multiply. 215 times eight is 1720 and when you add up all those bowling scores you get 1434 plus that other score. Now subtract 1434 from each side and that will give you the score that Joey needs. When you subtract you'll get 286. Number three is also a concept from Unit 5. You need to be able to analyze and interpret data displays. You can see that we have a stem and leaf plot where a zookeeper analyzed the number of lizards at each major zoo in the United States. Remember that each of those numbers on the right represents a value. How many zoos have fewer than 26 lizards? Well, we can see when we start, that's where our numbers start. Our first number is 20, and then it jumps right to 26. So there is only one zoo that has fewer than 26 lizards. What is the median number of lizards? So you just need to remember that median means the middle. So you can count the number of data values that you have. So over here, if you count them, there are 15 data values. So to get to the middle, you're going to count 7. So we start in the 2 row, and we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so this next, that's our 8, and we should have 7 on the other side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yes. So the median number is 36 lizards. What is the most... Sorry, I put that in the wrong... There, 36 lizards. Now, if the fewest number of lizards is removed, what is the median number of lizards at the major zoo? So the fewest number of lizards is 20. So if that is removed, we now have 14. So I count 7, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then I'm going to go right in the middle of those two numbers. But my two numbers are the same, 26 and 26. So what's in the middle of those? It's just that number. And sorry, not 26, 36. So the median did not change. Now what's the most common number of lizards at the zoo? So remember with the stem and leaf, look for a number on the right that's repeated the most. So we see three eighths, which is 28, 28, and 28. So 28 is the most common number of lizards at zoos, which is also called the mode, the most common number. Two concepts that you want to review are concepts 35 and 36, simplifying exponents. So that's just a matter of reviewing those exponent properties. So our directions are wrong here. We're not solving the systems of inequalities by graphing. So yours will be changed. We are simplifying these exponent expressions. So we just use any properties that we can to do any simplifying that we can. Think of order of operations, so look inside the parentheses. Notice that we have m to the fifth divided by m to the ninth. When you divide same bases, you can subtract the exponents. Take the bigger one minus the smaller, 9 minus 5, and that's to the fourth, and that's since the bigger exponent term started in the denominator, that's when it, where it will end up. And then we just have our n to the 6th. Now all of that is still raised to the negative 3 power. But remember to simplify a ratio that's raised to the negative, we can simply take the reciprocal of it to the positive power. So we can write that as m to the 4th over n to the 6th to the positive 3rd. And then a final property that we'll use is raising a power to a power. 
When you do that, you multiply the exponents. So 4 times 3 is 12. 6 times 3 is 18. So this is our simplified exponent expression. Now in B, I just usually start with the numerator and take one variable at a time. So notice we have y to the 7th over y to the 12th. We're dividing, so that means we're going to subtract those exponents. 12 minus 7 is 5. The bigger exponent term was in the denominator, so that's where it ends up. And then I use the cross-off method, so I know what I've simplified. Now z to the 9th divided by z to the 3rd power, I'm going to subtract. 9 minus 3 is 6. And then finally, x squared divided by x to the negative 5, I'm going to subtract bigger minus smaller. 2 minus a negative 5 is the same as 2 plus 5, so x to the 7th. And so that's my term simplified. Now concept 38 is solving exponential equations using common bases. So at number 5 and 6, we're going to solve those equations. <clears throat> so we look at the bases and think, can I rewrite those as the same base raised to different powers? Well, I know that 3, or 243, is 3 to the 5th power. And this one has a base of 3. So now if your bases are the same, you can just simply set those exponents equal to each other. So 1 minus 2x equals 5. So we can subtract the 1 and then divide by negative 2. So x equals negative 2. b has 216 raised to the a power equaling 36 raised to the 2a minus 2. So I know that 36 is 6 squared, and so I can check and see that 216 is 6 to the third power. So I can rewrite those 216 and 36 as powers of 6, raised to the a power and then raised to the 2a minus 2 power. So when I raise a power to a power, I multiply. So that becomes 6 to the 3a equaling 6 to the, got to distribute, 4a minus 4. My x's, I'm sorry, my, um, I can drop the bases, and so I'll get 3a equals 4a minus 4. I can subtract 4a from both sides. So negative a equals negative 4, and then divide both sides by negative 1. a equals, so a equals 4 on that. Okay. On number 6, <clears throat> we're going to review concept 40. So using methods to multiply binomials and trinomials. What is the simplified form of the expression 4x plus 1 times 2x plus 6? So that means multiply the binomials. So one method that was um, covered in the notes was using a 2 by 2 grid, since you have a binomial multiplied by another binomial. So you simply place the terms above a column and then out to the side of the rows. And then you multiply. So in the first box you multiply 4 times 2, which is 8, and x times x, x squared. 1 times 2x, which is a positive 2x. 4x times 6, which is a positive 24x. And finally, 1 times 6, which is 6. So we'll add, but note that we can combine the 2x and the 24x. So simplified, this is 8x squared plus 26x plus 6. In concepts 41 and 42, you learn factoring and then factoring and solving binomials and trinomials. You just have to look at each problem and kind of take it one at a time. So 7a says, what are the solutions to 4a squared minus 18a? So let's see if we can factor. Remember when we're factoring, we always look for a greatest common factor, which can be numbers and variables. So I know that 2 will divide into both 14 and 18, and also I can divide out 1a. 
So that's my factor that will come out front. And then once I divide those out, I have 7a minus 